Thanks. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's so very nice, especially because I get to spend the day not in a suit. So uh, thank you, Jack, for the invitation. Thanks, Basim, for the, for the invitation. Um, my task here today is to discuss Turkey in transition, which is both apt and odd at the same time. But before I get into my, the heart of my discussion, I want to do away with or address a number of issues that have framed debates about Turkey and Turkish politics over a long period of time. The first is that somehow Turkey is separate from this region, and that it is different from the region, that it does, doesn't really belong in the region. Maybe that's a function of the fact that uh, in the US government, Turkey is part of Europe and not part of the Middle East. But in fact, Turkey is most of, uh, especially over the last 15 years, Turkey has been face forward more towards the Middle East and uh, has developed deeper ties with countries in the Middle East than with, uh, with Europe. The second is that the idea that Kemalism, this set of ideas that are associated with Mustafa Kemal, known worldwide as Ataturk, that these ideas have become common sense for Turks that it become deeply embedded in the minds of Turks and that Turks accept these ideas. Um, that is, I think, a, a point of tremendous contestation and part of the problem that we find in Turkey today. And then um, part of, of this I, set of ideas about Turkey and Kemalism and the idea that uh, these ideas have become common sense embedded in the minds of people is the idea that Secularists are Democrats and will always be Democrats. And that in Turkey, we need to support, the US government needs to support secularists because they are Democrats. I think we need to do away with uh, a number of those myths. Now, getting back to this, uh, this is a panel on countries in transition. First, it's, few people really would have imagined in October 2004 when the EU Commission recommended that Turkey begin formal negotiations to join the European Union. That 15 years later, someone would be standing before folks here at George Mason University and not talking about Turkey's transition to democracy and Turkey's entry into the European Union or about to be a member of the European Union and rather talk about Turkey's transition from a promising member of the EU to essentially an elected autocracy. Um, Turkey was never much of a democracy, but it was dem democratic enough. It had regularly scheduled elections, which were free and fair. The military always handed power back to civilians after its four coups. Turks had internalized some democratic practices and norms, but it wasn't much of a democracy. The kinds of changes that Turkish governments undertook in the late 1990s and early 2000s, especially under the Justice and Development Party between 2002 and 2004, raised the prospect that Turkey under a political party whose patronage was very clearly Turkey's Islamist movement might bring the country into the European Union. Um, this, as I said, uh, has over the course of the last 15 years, this is uh, a kind of, uh, if you don't mind, a false dawn um, for uh, transit. You're always selling the book, uh, a, 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 a false dawn. It, it, it was, as I said, for American policymakers, democratic enough. Never mind that there were Kurds who didn't fit into the ethno-nationalist paradigm of the Kemalist state. Never mind the fact that pious Turks Many pious Turks felt that they had been disenfranchised because of Turkey's officially secular system. I don't need to remind any Turkish speakers here that secular actually isn't the right word to capture that, but be that as it may. It was all good enough for American policymakers. As I said, along came the Justice and Development Party and the big man in the party, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Contrary to a view of an increasing number of Turks, a very uh, number of Western analysts who believe that Turkish politics 
from the time the Justice and Development Party was elected in November 2002, that it, the outcome that we see now was preordained. Actually, I think history and politics works quite differently from this kind of conspiracy theory tinged view of what the AKP stands for and what actually happened in Turkey over the course of the last 15 years. Um, the deepening of Turkish authoritarianism over this period of time, without dismissing the kind of majoritarian worldviews of Recep Tayyip Erdogan and some of the other founders of the Justice and Development Party, is really have to do with a combination of factors having to do with, one, Turkish history, Erdogan's paranoia both as an extraordinarily shrewd politician and a Turkish Islamist politician in particular, the Turkish establishment's efforts to undermine the Justice and Development Party, and of course, the fecklessness of the European Union. Don't worry, I'll get to the United States. Um, I'm going to spare you the details of French, German, Austrian opposition to Turkey's entry into the European Union, and thus Turkey, an, an anchor of Kemalist reform. I think that Europe has never decided, or when it came to Turkey's candidacy, Europe actually did decide that it was not a club of countries based on a common set of norms and democratic ideals, but rather a, a, a club of countries based on geography coterminous with predominantly Christian countries. It's OK to have Muslim minorities in Europe, but you cannot have a country of 82 million people, 98% of whom are Muslim, entering into the European Union. It doesn't make sense for many, many Europeans, and it certainly doesn't make sense for European politicians. Um, uh, is, so there was op the, 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 the opposition from the European Union. Uh, there was a number of events in Turkey around 2007 and 2008 that were the triggers for this change. The first was an attempted coup d'etat in May of 2007, when the Justice and Development Party nominated their own foreign minister, a guy named Abdullah Gul, to become the next president of Turkey, and the military issued a warning on its website saying that it did not look kindly on the idea of someone with a hijab in the Tunkaya Palace, meaning Abdullah Gul's wife. Uh, this created uh, protests in the streets of Turkey, people saying no to military rule, no to Sharia. Erdogan as prime minister called elections and won those elections with 47% of the vote, putting the military on its heels and subsequently nominating Abdullah Gul successfully to become the president. It was a victory for the Justice and Development Party, but it served as a warning for the Justice and Development Party what might come. The second factor was what became known as the Ergenekon Conspiracy. The Ergenekon Conspiracy eventually became a conspiracy within a conspiracy within a conspiracy within a conspiracy. But it started out as revelations on uh, that were uncovered of a group of people seeking to sow violence and instability in the streets of major Turkish cities in order to encourage the military to come out and undertake a coup d'etat. It was discovered the Justice and Development Party and its allies at the time turned the tables on these people, but nevertheless, again, a victory, but it sent a message to the Justice and Development Party. And that message, uh, uh, in the, pardon me. And then the third thing was that in 2008, the prosecutor generals filed a case within Turkey's constitutional court alleging that Turkey is, uh, that the Justice and Development Party is a center of anti secular activity, a violation of the Turkish constitution, and therefore should be closed. It turns out that the constitutional court did find that the AKP was a center of anti-secular activity, but didn't have enough votes on the constitutional court to actually close the party. That was a function of the AKP's own reforms, that you needed a certain number of justices on the constitutional court. So they squeaked by with a $20 million fine. All of these things, the combination of all of these things, convinced Erdogan and his large and dynamic constituency that the European elite and that the Turkish elite together would never allow the Justice and Development Party, a party of Islamist 
patrimony to rule and govern Turkey. So out went the previous five years based on consensus and compromise. Instead, Erdogan and the party pursued a strategy that sought to pulverize the opposition and bend them to his will of a moralizing religious base, though not theocratic project for Turkey's uh, transformation. In this, I should add, just as an aside, that Erdogan had an enthusiastic partner in the Hizmet, known conventionally here in the United States as the Gulenist movement, uh, and followers of Fethullah Gulen, the, exiled, the self-exiled cleric who lives in Pennsylvania, which is why when you watch Erdogan's speeches like I do, and he carries on about Pennsylvania, he's not actually talking about the state of Pennsylvania, he's talking about one resident of Pennsylvania. And as a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, when I go to Turkey, I leave my Pennsylvania t-shirt at home. <laughs> Um, thus began, actually, in 2007, 2008, and 2009, a purge, a purge of this Kemalist elite, of military officers, of academics, of journalists. That purge transformed into another purge, beginning in 2014, between that purge began the purge of Gulenists from the political system that only accelerated in 2016 after the failed coup d'etat. What we see in Turkey is a kind of stunning irony in that throughout the Justice and Development Party, two minutes, come on, throughout the Justice and Development Party period, you have a broadening of politics, but a, a, an inability, a restricting of the, uh, of the ability of people to actually contest politics. And the other stunning irony of Turkish politics during this period is that Kemalism is dead, but long live Kemalism. That the Justice and Development Party coming to power, vowing to undermine the institutions and coercive instruments of the Kemalist state, have actually leveraged those institutions and those coercive instruments to their own ends. Very quickly, since I have two minutes left, which is great because I'm about to talk about the United States, and you'll understand why it's good that I only have two minutes left. Certainly, the United States has been silent, mostly silent, about what's happened in Turkey only because, well, not only because, because these are the things that we do, because we had bigger, quote unquote, strategic interests. And that was one airfield in the southeastern portion of Turkey in which to, what was it, Basim? I like when you quote CIA, degrade and destroy um, the Islamic State. I, I didn't do destroy. I, I know, I know. I'm kidding around. Um, that this was an excuse for the United States not to address the issue of the deepening of Turkey's authoritarianism, while at the same time, the Obama administration was holding Turkey out as a model for the Arab world after the uprisings. Um, let me just quickly move to my concluding remarks because I don't pay for you and I won't get that kind of privilege. Um, we have gone in Turkey from a model partner, a strategic relationship, to a situation in debate in Washington, D.C., where either members of Congress want to punish Turkey for Erdogan's politics. And it's kind of interesting what they focus on. There's a lot of things. Turkey is the, is the jails more journalists than any other country in the world, more than China, more than Egypt, has more political prisoners in the, in the region than any other country. Yet Congress is focused on the rumble on Sheridan Circle last May. That's what they want to punish uh, Turkey over. It divided between those who want to punish Turkey over a variety of transgressions and the policy wonks who want to save the relationship. Here's the problem. There is no saving a relationship, and there is no, I see zero time, I'm taking it. Um, uh, there is no saving a relationship. The world has changed. We need to see things for how they are, rather than how they used to be, a strategic relationship that actually never, was always more theoretical than it actually, or what we, or the way in which we would like it to be, which we clearly do not have the power to do. The relationship, has always been difficult, but 
we're not likely to have the same kind of relationship because those overarching issues that brought the two countries together are no longer there. There is no overarching Soviet threat. There is no peace process to work with the Turks on. There is no Turkey as an anchor of security and stability in the Middle East. There is no Turkey as a model for the Arab world, as silly as that was to begin with. Turkey and the United States has changed. Turkey has legitimate beefs with the United States, and the United States has legitimate beefs with Turkey. Turkish leaders and apparently a large number of Turks resent American hegemony, resent the idea that they should be an asset in the service of somebody else's interests, and no longer, no longer want to play that, that, uh, play that game. They would prefer, as Turkey, a large and influential country to pursue their own interests in the service of Turkish interests, which is why, against the will of the United States, they have carved out a sphere of influence in uh, Syria, uh, the most neuralgic issue between the United St States. Going forward, the United States has often said, we will get what we get and not get upset when it comes to our relationship with Turkey. But going forward, I think we should change it to working with the Turks where we can, staying out of their way where possible, and opposing them we must, where we must. One of the places, however, we should oppose them, and of course I don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of confidence that we will, is on the, elect the, the deepening of authoritarianism in Turkey. And what is about to happen in June, where Erdogan will be reelected, there will be a new uh, Justice and Development Party majority in the Turkish Grand National Assembly, and Erdogan will be the new Sultan. Thanks very much.